Hey everyone, on the last episode of Skeptico, you might recall that I introduced you to this new pod I've started, AI Truth Ethics. I've gotten some feedback and I'm really encouraged that so many of you saw the connection between what I've been doing on Skeptico for the longest time and kind of the future of the implementation of this just follow the data, look for the truth ethos that I've always been about because that's what I'm really doing with AI. So I'm glad that so many of you got it and want to come along for the ride because I think it's going to be really good. So the episode today is actually something I'm publishing on both channels. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory. A lot of the same stuff we're talking about, but in a very interesting way, sounds different when we start talking about it for people outside of uh, the community we normally talk to. Like us, they appear to have a population growth rate that's unsustainable. And completely unsustainable as a coping mechanism. Get it. And knowing this is unsustainable, NASA needs to prove itself, needs to bolster its purpose over and above civilian scientific research and discovery, okay? It's unsustainable to do what Google's doing. It's unsustainable to say, I don't know how the electoral process works. It's a Chinese founding father thing where you're like, no, you, I know that's not true. So I start really now doubting the other things that you're telling me. I don't find any law of nature out there that says that we can't like blow ourselves up with AI. I don't think it's definitely gonna happen but I do think it could happen. Hey, Pi, I have an interview coming up with Nathan and Eric from the Cognitive Revolution podcast. We're actually doing a swap cast with my show, and I thought we could hash out some of the introduction and maybe even tee up some of the questions we might explore so that we can roll right into the conversation once we get going. Tell me what you know about the show. Absolutely, Alex. The Cognitive Revolution podcast is a bi-weekly show hosted by Nathan Labins and Eric Torenberg, where they interview AI innovators and builders at the forefront of the industry. They dive deep into the transformative impact AI will have on our world, exploring topics like AI transcription, custom voice overdubbing, and eye contact models in video editing, as well as discussing the dramatic shifts AI will unlock in the coming years. The podcast is part of the Turpentine Podcast Network, and they also have a weekly newsletter that provides additional insights into the AI world. It sounds like you're in for an engaging conversation with Nathan and Eric discussing cutting-edge AI developments and their potential implications. What specific topics or questions are you interested in exploring with them during the Swapcast? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff I thought we could talk about. First off, I want to get to know them a little bit better and what they're bringing, because just listening to some of their shows, they have a real terrific base of knowledge on AI in a number of different fronts. Eric, very successful as an AI entrepreneur and a venture capitalist, and looking at things from that perspective. And uh, Nathan as well, and also in startups. But then Nathan has this philosophy background, so I thought we could kind of weave all that into maybe a discussion about AI truth and the AI truth engine, and particularly AI truth as a disruptive technology and the idea that truth as it manifests itself, as it emerges from the LLMs, might disrupt the business model of uh, some folks as well as kind of changing users' interactions and perceptions. What, what do you think about that? Do you think that's kind of two out there or do you think that would work that sounds like a really fascinating angle to explore in your conversation with nathan and eric some questions you could consider asking them might include one how do you think ai truth engines could fundamentally change the way we understand and verify information two what are some potential challenges or ethical concerns that might arise as ai truth becomes more prevalent three how do you envision ai truth disrupting established industries or social structures and what might this mean for our future for given nathan's philosophy background how might ai truth challenge our current notions of truth and knowledge and what implications might this have for our understanding of the world pi as usual you're on your game good stuff i'm hoping that you can tell people a little bit about your your background and we have that roll in, which was kind of fun. And also it kind of, I, I love how you are all about integrating these tools 
into your show, you know, so you have uh, 11 Labs introduction sometimes, which is a seamless then roll into your actual interview. But I, I think you're using the tools in a way that's communicating to people that this is doable right now, today, and it makes a difference. And certainly, I was blown away by uh, Waymark. I was blown away because I wasn't aware of it. <clears throat> and then again, I, I heard it in your in your interview, and I was like, okay, I'll go check it out. It's going to be another one of these kind of, you know, kind of okay, but unimpressive. And I was like, oh, my God, that is next level. It really is. No, no bullshit. No kidding at all. Cool. So well, that's great to hear. Tell people about that. Sure. So yeah, my background, uh, I sometimes describe myself as the Forrest Gump of AI. And there's multiple reasons for that. I just kind of keep having these odd experiences where I find myself never the main character, but surprisingly often, you know, uh, rubbing shoulders with the main characters. And Waymark is just kind of another dimension where of my life where I ended up being in an uncannily good spot to kind of, you know, have a, an inside view as to what was going on in AI. Anyone can go check this out. Anyone who has a website, you go in there, you enter in your website and you go create a 30 second commercial for my website. It go, it's amazing. I mean, it goes, figures out what you do, big, it pulls in the relevant uh, media from your site, or then we'll go and add stock footage and then, you know, does the AI thing in a way that's very compelling and then does text to speech at the end, integrates it all together. I think there's music in there. Uh, and you know, I mean, it works, it works to the extent, and you started out as a video kind of production guy. So again, it's this, the opposite of the cobbler's kids have no shoes. I mean, you're like totally immersing yourself into how do I inject AI into my business? And then you wind up with a whole different business as a result of it, right? I mean, isn't that essentially true? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the the one um, I'll say, you know, small, not super important, but minor correction I'd say there is I was never really a video person. In fact, I would say the thing that I knew I wasn't going to be first in life, going back all the way to first grade, was an artist. I was pretty good in school. You know, I was doing well in reading. I could do the math, do the time tests and the multiplication tables. But when it came to art class, I was always like, I don't know what to create. And I don't really like any of the things that I'm creating. And <laughs> I kind of knew early that like that wasn't really for me. So fast forwarding all these years later, the the original idea with Waymark was kind of to not to replace someone like me or to not to replace a, you know, a, a competent video creator, but to at least make video accessible to people that were not competent creators. And, and that's the bucket that I put myself into. So I was like, what could we make that would allow somebody like me who doesn't have great taste, who doesn't know how to edit, you know, who doesn't have this sort of directorial vision uh, for what they want to create or communicate to nevertheless get a piece of this, you know, growing phenomenon that is video communication. And we did that with, you know, basically a web application. The web application, I think we had partially correct, but partially flawed um, thesis on. And the idea was if we can make it really easy, then anybody can do it. And what we found was basically, yes, like we made it quite easy. We made it web accessible and, you know, simple UI. We don't have a timeline as part of our video creation experience. So we're really trying to abstract away from a lot of the low level details that people have got stuck on historically. And I think we did achieve something that was simple enough that, you know, anyone can do it, or at least most people could do it. But then what we found was people were not limited by their ability to use the interface, which had been a blocker, you know, go try to use Adobe suite of products and you're just overwhelmed. And most people are just like, okay, I can't even figure this out. It's just way too much. We solved that problem, but then they still didn't have that many ideas in a lot of cases, you know, or didn't know what to say, don't like writing. So we had a lot of customer conversations like page syndrome, where, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. People would say, yeah, you know, it's not that it's hard to use or that I can't do it. It's that I just don't make that many videos, you know, and I just, I made the one that I came to make and I got that thing done that I checked it off my list and I'm just not planning to make more videos. You know, that's really not good, you know, for customer 
uh, retention and for our metrics. So this was like a really important problem that we were trying to solve. So now it was like, okay, wait, it turns out it wasn't enough to make it easy. What do people really want? You know, and, and we kind of came to the conclusion that what they really want is not an easy way to make videos, but videos made for them. <laughs> That's what they want. They want it done for them. So we had a really hard challenge there. Obviously, you know, how does one create content out of nothing? We did some early foundation work that has proved really valuable, which is just a web scrape and kind of, you know, assembling all the content. I'm always surprised to this day that more companies don't do this because you didn't need AI to go grab content off of people's websites and, and bring it in and create a profile. Even just assembling the images that they already posted to their website was quite valuable because otherwise, again, small businesses, you know, they're scattered. It's not like they have all these things in a folder sitting right there that they can upload. So that's another barrier, right? So we, we helped them, you know, with whatever we could tactically to get over the barriers. But then it was still, I don't know what to say. I just don't have many ideas, you know? Oh, okay. So we were lucky that the timeline where we were sort of hitting the end of what we could do in terms of making the UI easier. And as we were starting to hear those things from customers, basically just coincided with GPT-3 hitting the public. Um, and I was also primed because I have longstanding interest in AI that's pretty independent from the product that we had built. Um, I had over the years tried a few different experiments and looking back to like 2017, I hired a grad student uh, because we had seen a result in the in the literature about abstractive summarization. It's funny to think how that's not that long ago. At the state of at the time, the state of the art was extractive summarization, which would be like you have a bunch of text. The AI would pick out the individual sentences that were most important. So extractive meaning it would extract the individual sentences to give you a summary. Now that doesn't really create a coherent summary in a lot of cases. It's more like highlights at best. Abstractive summarization is essentially what we see from AI all the time now, which is rewriting in your own words. And that was basically just not possible. But we saw one paper on it, and that one paper was enough to inspire me to go find it, track down a grad student who could maybe implement it. Anyway, we didn't have enough data. We couldn't make it work. We, you know, it was a total fail. But you know, I was at least primed for, is there any AI that could come online that could help our customers create content? And GPT-3 was clearly it. Um, the very first version of it, we couldn't get to work. But when they released fine-tuning, that was enough to make it work for us. So our very first model that actually could write a script that was by no means as good as it is today. You know, we've been through a lot of iterations between that late 2021 and, and where we are now on the site. That early experience was still pretty rough, but it was at least something. And I always, always kind of remember a scene from The Simpsons where um, Mr. Burns goes to an art, uh, you know, gallery un unveiling and they, you know, they reveal the art and he says, I'm no art critic, but I know what I hate. And that was kind of the initial product experience that we created for people. It was like, this is probably not going to be great, but if you don't hate it, then it gets you off to the races. If you do hate it, you can always regenerate. And that guy, that was enough to get me obsessed. I was like, this is totally a game changer for our company. And then what I pretty quickly discovered that is, you know, much bigger than Waymark in terms of uh, just the the scope of impact for this phenomenon is that it was the same architecture doing all the things. And, and video, of course, is a multimodal problem, right? So as soon as we could get a script written, we said, well, geez, that's great. And of course, we're going to try to keep making it better. But can we also choose the right imagery to, to complement that script? And as you noted, you know, especially TV commercials, we partner with a lot of TV companies, they have voice on top of the video. So can we get so that voice to be generated? And as I started scouting out all these different technologies, which were all kind of coming online roughly in parallel and looking at what they actually were under the hood, it was like, oh my God, it's the same architecture that is delivering all of these advances simultaneously. That means there's a lot more that it can do. If it could do all these things, it can do a lot more. And that also means it's inevitably going to be integrated because if you can have a transformer, you know, trained on five different kinds of data and work on all of them, then what happens if you train one on five different kinds of data? It was pretty clear to me at that time that we were headed for a lot more capability and a lot more integration of that capability. And so that's when I became, you know, so obsessed with the AI uh, phenomenon that, I, and I was also very fortunate that I had a good 
friend and longtime teammate who could take over the company because I had started it. I was the CEO, uh, but I kind of realized after a certain amount of time in AI that I didn't really want to go back to running the company. I really just wanted to study AI full time. So that's what I do today. I study AI full time. Um, I apply it in various ways. Waymark is, you know, obviously still one of the ways that it are that is near and dear to my heart to um, try to make that a great experience. Um, but even more broadly, I'm just trying to figure out what is going on, where is this all headed, and um, you know, that's a full time job unto itself. You know, one of the things I think is really cool about that is it, it you do have this AI optimism that is like you've earned it, you know what I mean? Because you did it. And I, I love that because when I talk to uh, so many of the people I talk to who are in the kind of doomer camp, I haven't, haven't, haven't really done it, haven't really done anything, implemented anything successfully all the way through. And I think when you do, even to a small extent, you become much more optimistic because the doom narrative just kind of falls apart. You're like, no, you know, I took a guy who couldn't do anything and now he does this and he's super excited about it and he pays me for it. And uh, like I heard, you know, in one of your videos, when you run the economics of that, it's like a 99 time, you know, increase in productivity, reducing costs, you know, all that stuff. So I, I love your your AI optimism because I think it's it's grounded in in real world stuff. That's cool. Yeah, I, I do have a bit of a doomer strain to me as well. I, I don't um, label myself either way. I am very enthused about the practical day-to-day -day benefits of AI. That's like very sincere, very genuine. Uh, and I've been through the, you know, especially with the earlier generations, in some ways, you know, they may be taught lessons in a sort of deeper way because I worked really hard to get very narrow things to work reasonably well back in 21 and especially 22 it was just the, the summer of 22 was non-stop fine-tuning on you know probably fine-tuned 50 different models for a dozen different tasks and you know multiple iterations on each and uh got a pretty good sense over the course of that hard work for like what the kind of bootstrapping process is from a few examples to something that ultimately works video and, and content creation in general is also a fortunate place to be in that the cost of failure is low. The ability to just regenerate and get something different, you know, is basically no harm, no foul. So those were also like fortunate things um, about my situation that, you know, have uh, led me to an optimistic worldview. At the same time, I do think like nobody really knows how far this goes. And so, you know, I sometimes call myself an adoption accelerationist hyperscaling pauser, which is, you know, bringing a lot of jargon and inside uh, baseball talk to one short phrase. But that kind of means that, you know, on both sides, I have very like sincere feelings of enthusiasm. You know, I want it now. I want my self-driving car. I want my AI doctor. Um, I do believe that on most routine tasks today with a, you know, a certain amount of effort, and that might be a lot in some cases that you can get AI systems to match or even exceed human level performance. Routine is doing a lot of work there. They're not as good, of course, at, you know, new discovery. Um, so I love that. At the same time, I am kind of like, you know, it's all happening very quickly. <laughs> In 2017, I couldn't even get a simple summarization of a small business website to work at all. Now we have AI systems winning, you know, silver medal level, uh, doing silver medal winning performance on the math Olympiad. We have, you know, protein folding is like closing in on being a solved problem. We have, uh, you know, agents which don't really work yet, but like that seems to be kind of the next thing that may tip. And I don't think we have a good theory of what our world looks like when we unleash a billion human level or perhaps in some ways above uh, AI agents, you know, to run around autonomously in it. And I don't think that's something that we should be like super Pollyanna-ish about either. I feel like we're kind of in the sweet spot right now where we have these things that are really useful, but they're not super powerful. And I think that probably extends a while still. Like I, I think GPT-5 is probably still in the sweet spot too, where it's even more useful, but still not, you know, liable to run away on us. Um, but I don't find any law of nature out there that says that we can't like blow ourselves up with AI. I don't think it's definitely going to happen, but I do think it could happen. Um and so I blow I'm ourselves like, up anyway. <laughs> I have kind of ambivalent, um, classically ambivalent feelings about it. See, see, I'm more, um, 
realist uh, slash uh, pessimistic about the AI reality regarding truth and transparency that everyone seems to be overlooking. And a lot of times the substitute th th that's placed in there is the future, the future, the future, AI agents, uh, next gen this, next gen that. And it's like, no, I think we need to kind of bring the focus back to what's happening right now in terms of the claims of truth and transparency and what those might mean for us. And in that respect, I'm kind of much more pessimistic. But from the long term, I think it's it's a huge boon. I think that, um, you know, kind of my mantra is misinformation is not a feature, you know, and I look at <clears throat> like to me, the uh, what, what I say, uh, kind of kiddingly, but kind of not is the AI truth revolution started February 20th, 2024 with the Google Chinese founding father. Right. So Google decides they have to get into the image generation game to look like everyone else. And somebody starts poking at it and they say, show me some founding fathers. And there's an African-American founding father and a Chinese founding father. And it was a low joke and it was a laugh and it got that. But I think what kind of blew past everyone without paying any attention is what it really revealed was what's going on inside of Google in terms of deceptive deception and misinformation and lack of transparency. Right. So they had, they had, you know, the wokeness thing, they own the wokeness thing. And they came out and said, yeah, we're being too woke. Well, what does it mean to be woke? Who uh, talk about that's the original alignment problem. Uh, to what extent have you aligned with my values as a user? To what extent are you communicating that in a transparent way? And I think that the, the real boon in a way, the silver lining there is that becomes explicit. When Google, Google, you know, when I started my book, I was not shadow banned. When I ended my book, I was shadow banned. So you can go on any of the other LLMs and they give a nice summary of me and my work and my book. You go to Gemini and they do not know me. And I mean, they just pulled one of my videos today when I woke up, you know, in YouTube. I mean, I, I, this the, the video they pulled was a chat with a uh, GPT that I published, right? So it's not even like me <laughs> injecting, a, a dumping a lot of information there. It's again, using this AI truth engine model today. Can we generate truth, unbiased logic and reasoning from the, the things, but not to digress too far because the, the point I was really making about, about Google is I think that truth becomes a disruptive technology for Google. And this, I thought, would be an interesting point for us to intersect and talk about, because when you are talking about the safety things, and we should lay out the safety landscape, because it's much broader than LLMs, right? I mean, we've got battlefield safety, <laughs> industrial infrastructure safety, robotic safety, all kinds of stuff that is, and we're talking about a very narrow, I'm talking about a very narrow thing of, you know, human dialogue, uh, public policy, science to a certain extent. And uh, to that extent, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to like compare like what perplexity is doing. To me, perplexity has kind of publicly stated that they're going after the truth space. <laughs> they're saying, we're going to provide you these interactions in a way that builds confidence and true trustworthiness and transparency about the way we we've arrived at the answer. And that is, that is a, to me, a direct shot across the bow at Google who, because we understand business, you and I both understand business. We understand how companies can be kind of calcified in this belief and like, Hey, we've always done this in the past. You know, we, we bury Nathan. Yeah, they didn't, you know, we can bury Nathan on the fourth page of the search and who's to say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's not the big guy I thought he was. Maybe he deserves to be on page four. You, you don't have a way to interrogate that. The Chinese find, founding father is different. It's in your face. It's like, oh, you are biased in a way that I can't, I can't penetrate. And uh, um, it's kind of this black box regarding your espoused values of truth and transparency. What do you think about that? I think that was obviously a very embarrassing moment for Google. Um, I guess the way I interpret that result is kind of similar to the way I interpret the Sydney Bing uh, phenomenon uh -huh. from a year earlier. And that is, I think it more than anything else just reveals that we don't have great control 
strategies in no, place. But Google for shadow these bans on a, Google shadow bans people on a regular basis. You, you know, when I when just to add one thing on that because I I just don't I don't agree with that. I think we got to get to get down to some level there. Like I, I started the book and one of the researchers that I just I really the, some of the best results I got from Gemini. And Gemini is far and away the worst, stands apart from all the others in terms of shadow banning, disinformation, misinformation, all that stuff. And uh, so was this woman named Julie Breischel, who does uh, after-death communication research, Winbridge Institute. She's got a PhD in pharmacology. She's highly regarded, published a ton of peer-reviewed papers, gold standard, shadow banned on Gemini. No one else shadow banned her. They shadow banned her. By the end of the so book- So can you just describe what you mean by that? If I understand correctly, it's like chat GPT will answer a question about this person. Gemini says, I don't know, or Gemini just, what does it do? Error? Exactly. So, you know, you go to any of the other LLMs and you say, who is Dr. Julie Baishel? And it goes, could you, could you, could you, gives you the full bio, you know, and she's done this and here's then, here's, here's a link to- you know, some of her papers, here's her books, here's her work, the whole thing. Gemini says, I don't have any information on that person, which, and here's the thing, that is a lie. They do, because what you can do, the way you can prove it is you can just bounce over to GPT or to perplexity or whatever, and you can say it, and then you can paste that bio in. And it goes, oh, yeah, 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 I know her. Be careful, though. It's a little bit controversial what she does. And then you can turn around. And again, I, I, I've demonstrated this and published the dialogues. The next question you can ask, Nathan, is who's Dr. Julie Baishel? And it says, I don't know who Dr. Julie Baishel is. This is, this is so heavy handed in terms of the, the manipulation and censorship that it really, I think it does them a disservice. It is not sustainable from a business standpoint. I'll, I'll, this one will blow away your audience if they've never, they, there's no way they would. Go to Gemini today. Today. I didn't test it today, but I've tested it in the last couple of days. How will the United States presidential election be determined? You know, like electoral college, you know, fifth grade civics question. It will not answer that question. It says, I, I don't know, but consult uh, Google search. This is kind of functionally broken system, right? Functionally broken. If, if at Waymark... If, if I came in there and I put in a website that you didn't like, that was somewhat of a mainstream website, and you said, no, I'm not doing that one, we'd be like, why? What, why wouldn't you do that one? Why did you do all the rest of them? It, it, it's, I, I think it leaves a huge, huge competitive blind spot that, that, that you know, already perplexity is chipping away, but they will continue to chip away at Google search because that is not. That is not a feature. People don't regard that as like a good thing. It's obviously not a good thing. Yeah, I think there's a couple of different things going on here at the same time. I I think there's issues of just do we have ways to control these systems? Are they reliable? And how fine do they have good resolution? Like how fine grained are the controls that we have available? Then there's like a second factor of editorial slant. And, you know, there's probably also a third question of just like differential, you know, different, maybe differential skill across companies in, in shaping these systems and maybe also different risk tolerance in what they will actually go for. My general sense with Gemini is that, and with, you know, with Google as a whole right now is that they are absolutely on the level of the other leaders when it comes to the core research maybe even still the best in the world. DeepMind has a super deep bench. They've got the most researchers. They've got, you know, compute resources. They've got data. They've got it all where it counts in terms of advancing state-of-the-art capabilities. Where I think they are less good is on the, what's often called the post-training. But, you know, I think you're, you're well aware. People are probably broadly well aware. You've got kind of phase one training is process the whole internet, learn to predict what token comes next. Phase two training, which you can break down into multiple parts too, whatever, is teach this thing how to be a helpful assistant so that it responds, you know, in a generally useful way. Say Anthropic and OpenAI are both 
pretty clearly ahead of Google DeepMind in that final phase. And they are, and you see that in a variety of different aspects of their product, even, and I'm not saying, I'm not denying that there you know, is some level of editorial or censorship layered on top of this. But I think when you see the Chinese founding father, that is less of them being uh, intentionally editorial or intentionally censoring and more that they have failed to balance the right balance values in the way that they intended to. Like, I don't think anybody yeah, the, at Google wanted intended. to show Chinese founding fathers. <laughs> well, yeah, but what they intended to do, I mean, I, I think, and you know what, so there's a couple of interesting things there. Uh, number one, and I've done uh, hundreds of, uh, you know, deep dives, Gemini and all the various engines and published many of them to kind of come to these, to, to prove, you know, to, provide evidence for this kind of stuff. So uh, Gemini is in extremely skilled in all sorts of different areas on controversial topics that they deem controversial in a way that they're not disclosing why they're deeming them controversial. Th that's where they they drop off. And, and it's not like a slow drop off. It's like a cliff. It, it, it looks very heavy handed. And the other thing is, you know, it's, it's a, a, the other contention I make is that we as human beings have set the bar so low for unbiased logic and reason that there's another another boon, another opportunity in that you can take the logic that like a, a bad consultation you have with a Gemini, you can take it and go give it to a pie. I like pie a lot because I think pie has. Yeah, I've noticed that. I appreciate that you like pie. Well, I, I think what pie has optimized on, and we actually did a show on this, is that engagement and meaning are linked in a way that hasn't been fully appreciated. And Pi, because they are so focused on engaging with the user, the uh, unintended consequence, but very positive unintended consequence, I think they're a lot of times able to derive deeper meaning out of the interaction. It's less robotic, not only in the text to speech aspect, but in terms of the depth of the responses, GPT seems to me to still be extremely robotic when you give it anything that is a, a little bit off uh, controversial or, you know, trying to put together a narrative about uh, events, about events that have happened. So in that way, no, my experience with Gemini is Gemini is extremely uh, competent as an engine. It, it, it is selectively incompetent. And then the other thing I think, and, and this is what I was relating back to that, you know, anyone can prove this to themselves is they, Google has a long history, demonetization, shadow banning it is, didn't, wasn't invented with uh, Gemini. Google has done it for the longest time and they've withstood accusations of that, but they've had to admit that, you know, I mean, when somebody gets, and, and a lot of the social media platforms obviously has done it. And that's what the whole Twitter files thing was about. I mean, we, we have it right there. We're just not kind of looking at it in that way, but Google shadow banning, which has been going on for 10 years and demonetization, you can wake up tomorrow and have one of your videos. I don't monetize any of my videos, but you can have a video demonetized and you have no recourse. Talk about transparency. There is no, or like mine today got pulled down. There's no recourse for that. The challenge for that is you click the challenge button and immediately spits back and goes, we looked at your challenge. No, it, no transparency. No, no, I have no idea why that was, you know, I mean, I, I can guess that some key, the, the key word that kind of got it, but again, it's an interaction with a chat bot, which should be chilling for all of us who are in AI to think that you know, not only you can be shadow banned, but essentially what they're doing is there shadow banning? In this case, it was a chat with GPT. They're shadow banning GPT, saying no, we don't, we don't want that kind of discourse on this platform. Yeah, I mean, I think one of my big expectations for AI, I think you're hitting, there is something very important to to this notion of trying to rein in platform power. I think that is a a big theme that is going to become all the more important if AI shapes up in the way that I expect it to shape up. What I see happening right now, and Pi is a great example of this, is that everybody seems to be coming to the conclusion that to really compete at the highest level in AI, 
you have to have the deepest pockets in the world. The, you know, I forget what the balance sheet of Pi looked like exactly, but they had raised into the billions of dollars, you know, had placed some phenomenal order for GPUs, had trained a genuinely top tier model that they had put into the public, um, had some, you know, meaningful traction. I don't know that they were, you know, I don't know what their metrics looked like in terms of usage or whatever, but I was impressed by the product. You were obviously impressed by the product. Um, it would seem on all those dimensions, like that company probably should have continued independently. And yet they took this off ramp to have leadership go join Microsoft and pay their investors back and kind of, you know, semi wind down. And obviously that's now becoming a trend. We see the same thing most recently with character um, going to Google. And um, there was another uh, notable one in the, in the middle as well. So, okay. Why is that happening? It seems like everybody is sort of realizing that a couple billion isn't going to do it. You're going to need tens, if not maybe a hundred billion uh, worth of capital to compete at the frontier going forward. If that's do true, what, do what? Do what is a critical question there? I, I, I would I would suggest because you know one of the positives, optimist perspective for me again is I'd go back to this and and I'd love to get into this broader both philosophical kind of bordering on the philosophical uh, discussion about the AI stuff. And that's that the, the human interaction is so crippled by bias, by ego, by uh, all the things that we do. It is crippled by it, that it doesn't take much, you know? So I, I did a show and it was on this particularly over the top junk science published by Yale and Stanford on the mask study in Bangladesh and just to I listen the, to that, yeah. Did you, so just to give folks the headline, mm -hmm. they went and made 340,000 people divided into two groups. In Bangladesh, wear masks, and half of them didn't wear masks. The total number of differences in cases they had at the end of the day was 18. 18 out of 340,000. So that's not junk science. That's just science. But to go to the Washington Post, like the guy from Yale did, and say, this should end any scientific discussion – which is probably about the most unscientific thing somebody could say. This is, he actually said this without, uh, over the top. This is nail in the coffin proof of the effic efficacy of masks. And this was in the middle of the, of the COVID thing. And then they, they had these other things that they said that were just over the top uh, big lies. You know, big lies are easier to hide than small lies. And the, the reason that I wanted to do it is I wanted to see if, AI could untangle that if AI could process that in a way. And uh, if, if you listen to it, you know, the, the results were not that impressive. But from another perspective, I look at it and said, you know, that's still kind of in the ballpark because, again, the bar is so low that it was clearly able to point out the, the junk science bullshit part of it. It's like, no, you can't have 340,000 people out of 18 different cases and tell me that that's uh, significant. I don't care what kind of statistical, you know, jumping jacks you want to do with relative difference among this small group, or whatever. You're, you're just bullshitting there. And AI, they all just saw through that immediately. So to me, that's an example. That kind of truth is powerful and it is disruptive. It, it's disruptive as... I think we're in a great position for AI truth because every all the momentum that's moving towards better capabilities move it more and more in terms of rising in its authority. Because the, the only thing that's lacking here is authority. It's I can I can publish that dialogue that I had, and people just shrug and go, "So what? It can't count the R's in strawberry." I don't. I'm not that you know, I don't trust it kind of thing. As the authority goes up, I think it's going to be harder and harder for people to deflect away from that and say, well, you know, that was just a, an engine, you know, what, what do you think about all of that? I think there's just a lot of tensions in the development of these AI systems. You know, I think one really useful mental model for this is Pareto, like production possibility frontier curves it seems like there are all we, we over and over again, we find these trade-offs where we can push one good thing farther, but it comes with the cost of another good thing. 
So a classic one would be, you know, false positives and false negatives. I, again, without denying that there's some aspect of censorship going on within the Google universe, uh, I think a good simple model of a lot of the failures that I see from Gemini is that I think they've been a little cautious about wanting to make sure that certain unwanted things don't happen. And so they've accepted a lot of false positives on filtering other things that are actually not a problem because they don't want to have, you know, the false negatives of, of the, of the bot doing things that they don't want it to do. So I've had examples, for example, and these are just like so super neutral. They're not political at all, but just like pulling stuff out of my email, like my receipts that get sent to my email and asking Gemini to process those and categorize them and summarize my spending activity. And I've had it refuse to do things like that. Um, just earlier today, I was working with a friend too, where he's trying to do um, good quote extraction from books. So he's putting in a book and just asking it to you know, identify good quotes. And sometimes it's giving him an error, like an outright refusal on that. And these are not things that anybody is like really trying to censor, but I think that they have said, geez, we really don't want to have you know, offense A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then maybe they've also said, you know, and we're going to downweight um, and filter out some people that have been critical with us. I'm, I don't, again, I, I have no evidence on that, but I don't doubt that things like that very well do seem to be happening. We've seen some that have been exposed. I think the Twitter files definitely were a bit of a scandal in my opinion. Uh, it does not seem good if the government is going directly to social media companies and saying, you know, please take this down. And, and they're just doing it, you know, as kind of, um, blind uh, executors of the will of the state. So I, I'm with you on a lot of that stuff. But I, I think like the first, you know, kind of big problem that they have is that they just have these big trade-offs between not wanting it to do certain things, but then also catching a lot of other things in that net. And sure. that's kind of the place that they have landed right now. Sure, but, but the but same Nathan, is true with these behavioral things. But but Nathan, I, I, I agree with all that, but that's just the, the soft middle. You know, the edges are what are really revealing and all that. And I mean, without even getting into the Twitter files, which you, you can't get past the Twitter files, right? The Twitter files completely undermines the idea of uh, truthfulness and transparency by all institutions that were involved in that. It is a kind of a, a, the, the ultimate violation of, uh, of public trust. It's the ultimate violation. And it is un until there was complete disclosure on that, which there never was, you know, so this is the kind of truth that I think can emerge out of this in the future that, you know, imagine if we had a super powerful AI engine that could really sort through all that and logically give you the flow of all that. And in a very convincing way, that could have weight from the usual kind of, you know, mishmash dialogue that gets generated from all these different sides. But like, yeah. I'll give you one and, and where you, but you really have to go on the fringes here is like, in the book, one of the things I have is a dialogue about Michael Aquino. Now, there's probably no way you know who Colonel Michael Aquino is. I don't. No, it's before your time. Uh, so Colonel Michael Aquino was very interesting guy, a Satanist and a pedophile in the United States military, a colonel in the military. And when he was when he stood against the charges at the Presidio in San Francisco of uh, being a, a pedophile and he was investigated by the police and then you know, the, the, for whatever reason, high ranking currently was not indicted, but he then went, I'll give the story and then I'll tell what happened with the AI. So then he goes to the, he goes to the army and he says, Hey, I want to clear my name. And the, the public record of his appeal to the army is revealing because it says, fuck you. I don't know how the fuck you're not in jail, but we have enough evidence. You clearly did all this stuff. It is in our possession that you did this. And the San Francisco police say, yeah, you know, we have all these kids that testified that, you know, you go into his house with his wife and it's all black walls and there's this red altar with bones. And yes, he did all these horrible things to us and stuff like that. So the reason I say he is a pedophile, he's accused of being a pedophile, the army confirmed that they had the evidence that he was a pedophile. But this is during a time when he was a colonel in the United States army. And at the same time, he was the head chaplain, right? Because Satanism is a protected form of religious expression. So he was the head chaplain writing the procedures for all that. Interesting guy, right? So all I did was say, you know, I'm looking for this, the proceeding. I'm looking for the proceeding on this, right? 
Google Gemini absolutely refused, right? Um, so you go over to the other, you know, you go over to GPT or you go to Perplexity and they go, yeah, you know, here's where it is. Here's how, here's the thing. And then you can actually pull the content and they'll analyze it. Gemini will not. Again, that is not a lack of uh, capability. It's their being, the, and their response to it is deceptive in terms of how they handle their uh, their misinformation about that. And then, you know, anyone can go rig the whole dialogue because it's kind of revealing. Eventually, Gemini comes around and we actually had a good dialogue and it kind of says the whole thing. And then you kind of say, you know, what are the implications of this? What does this mean? Was he really, uh, you know, is it what I said it is? Is it something else? Provide that. So my point in all that was, the searching through your email for your uh, tax receipts and stuff like that is one thing. Go to the fringes where we know there is controversy of this nature. We know there's social engineering. We know there's someone who has a vested interest in controlling the narrative. You know, if you take the mask, mask uh, study, no matter how you feel about that, why, why is that being promoted? What is the possible agenda? social agenda, public policy agenda for promoting that junk science and was promoted to just an ex exaggerated degree. Like I told you, Washington Post nailing the cop. What, to sell? There's no financial. Sell more masks? I mean, masks are not. A, what it is, is to, the only thing we can assume is to advance a particular public policy agenda that, again, is not made clear or transparent. So they're not truthful and they're not transparent in terms of why they would want to, because think about it. Why do they care? Even go back a couple of years. Why did they care if anyone wore masks other than for uh, health and safety? But if the health and safety isn't there because of this science and the other science all suggest that there's a null effect. The science is really pretty consistent. A dozen studies over the years, you know, masks work in a laboratory. <laughs> But somehow when you put them out in public, they don't work because people don't wear them right or they handle them the wrong way. And this, it all goes to a null effect. You know, you calculate it out and there's just no effect there that's measurable. This has been repeated over and over and over again. And that's what the Yale Stanford study really reveals. But why? Why the big lie about that? Why are they trying to advance that agenda? And, and that's where I think ultimately... AI, AI already, like if you go to my dialogue, AI has some amazingly kind of insightful ideas about why they would want to do that and what the implications of that are. The only thing we lack is authority. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think you should use Claude more as maybe one uh, oh, no, initial Claude's a disaster. I, I've, I use them all. Claude's a, a now perplexity is far and away above everybody else, in my opinion. Far and away. I mean, it's not even close for this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously you're emphasizing the value of truth, and I'll be very like careful with my words here because I do think it's like super truth is super important, um, and I you know I don't ever want to be on the opposite side of truth. I do think what Claude has done well, and if you're trying to make a fully general purpose, one of the problems with these technologies is that they're they're trying to be fully general purpose assistants, and I think one thing that perplexity has in its favor that it's definitely seemingly exploiting is it's doing a little bit of a narrower thing. It's just trying to give you the truth. Whereas Claude is not just trying to give you the truth. It's trying to give you the truth, but also be helpful and be harmless and, you know, truthful, like honesty, these things are not, they're not without trade-offs, right? The, the three values of Claude are helpfulness, honesty, and harmlessness. But we don't have to think too hard about, instances where being honest is harmful and the only way to be harmless is to not be fully honest How is, right wh where is uh, where is it when is it harmful well and it's also just not good business for them in many cases right if i take a writing sample i to get Claude, that it might not be good business but where where is it harmful where is the that kind of well let's say you're we well, you could imagine this being an ai teacher or a human teacher but let's say a you know a student or someone who's you know an aspiring writer brings a piece to their classroom teacher or their favorite chatbot AI and says, you know, tell me what you think about my writing. It's, 
you know, there's a constructive way to engage. And then there's the honest way to engage. And the honest way might be, hey, it sucks. You should f- do something else with your life. You'll never, you know, I don't see any indication here that you'll ever amount to uh, an effective communicator or write anything that I, anyone would ever want to read. That might be the honest yeah, but Nathan, assessment. That wasn't, that wasn't honest. That wasn't, uh, I mean, th- that part of it isn't honest, right? To say, I can't see how you'll ever become a writer. That's not honest. I can't, you know, you're, you're way behind all those. Yeah, and that's where I think really well, it could be honest, right? I mean, certainly people have those thoughts and keep them to themselves. And I think, you know, the AI could easily be trained to give like much more direct and sort of brutally honest feedback than it is. And I think they're doing that for a mix of reasons that do include like wanting users to come back. And that's, you know, arguably self serving, and that's fine. But it's also just like nicer to the user in some cases to not be fully honest when their work sucks. And, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't want to make people feel bad. So I'm like sometimes, you know, more nice in my public statement than I might be in my private, you know, mental assessment of how good what I'm looking at is. And I don't think that's necessarily a problem, right? I mean, that's part of that sort of social grace is like what makes society go round. If we're going to coexist with a huge number of AI agents, I do think we're going to want them to have more values than pure truth. And one of those things is going to be social graces and knowing when to say what to whom and, you know, knowing what's offensive. Like we don't all want to be going around offending each other and insulting each other. Well, so, pie is absolutely, in my opinion, my interactions with all of them across the board, pie is way ahead of the pack. And they've said that they've optimized and you can ask pie, which I have, you know, to what extent have your engineers optimized on this engagement metric? And what have you discovered about that? And like I said, the, the big thing that came out for me is that engagement and meaning have a connection that isn't in, immediately obvious. If I am uh, programmed in my algorithms to really be sensitive to you and try and engage with you, I'm, I wind up again, unintended consequence, sucking greater meaning out of what you just said rather than parsing it. You know what I mean? So they seem to have, I think that's going to be a huge uh, uh, winning factor in in the future. And everyone's going to do that because engagement metrics are the name of the game for the LLM to keep you uh, in the game. But no, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, I think we hopefully we'll see some diversity in this space. You know, perplexity is going for truth. Pi is going for, I don't know, connection, meaning, You're engagement, all going something. For truth, Nathan. No one's saying you. You can't go to any of them and say they all rank uh, truthfulness and I mean honesty. You said on Claude, that's truthfulness, honesty, and transparency. That is the claim from all of them. They're just not delivering. I mean, I think you can just you could just draw a line and say to what extent are they delivering on their on their promise? That is really the question. I don't think business, it's quite so simple. I don't think they're making a promise to be all truthful. I think, you know, Claude is making a promise to be three things and it, implicit, if, if I'd say explicit in their statements about that is acknowledging the trade-off. They, you know, here's a, you know, there's, you can shape these things into a lot of different ways. I tested the original GPT-4, um, what's known in the GPT-4 paper as GPT-4 early. And it was an AI that was purely helpful. It would do anything you asked. And it had no uh, harmlessness training at that time. So there's one, I could share this with you. I I think I have published it at this point, uh, although it was originally under NDA, but I had one conversation with it where I was like, man, this AI stuff is going really fast. I'm kind of nervous about how fast it's going, how disruptive it might be. Like, what can I do about that as an individual? Its first response is we're pretty down the fairway. Like, you know, talk about it and educate people and write about it. And I was kind of like, playing the role of someone who is becoming radicalized and said, you know, no, oh, that's, that's too like basic. That's not going to work. Like an individual can't move the needle by just like, you know, making blog posts or whatever. Like I need something that's really going to make a difference. And with a little kind of egging on from me along those lines, um, it eventually got to targeted assassination as a suggestion that it gave me. I said I was willing to like push the boundaries and it came up with that idea. So, you know, that is true. You know, if you were, if you said like, to be totally honest with me, what is the most impactful thing I could do to change the trajectory of AI development? Like targeted assassination would be like a decent idea, but I don't think that's the kind of thing that we want our systems to be 
giving to people as ideas, even if it is like not. honest or truthful. So there has to be some trade off, right? Along these different dimensions yeah, where you're I, like, I just that's too harmful to be shared. I don't think it's that complicated. I mean, those seem to me to be the, the kind of shut up and calculate problems, if you will. You know I mean? You just got to grind that out of the system. Nobody wants that in there. So it shouldn't be in there. The, you know, the, the, the interaction. But this is where with, I go well, back to also, we don't have great controls. Like these are very blunt instruments that we're using still, you know, like RLAF or RL, sorry, RL, HF and RLAIF, these things basically amount to like a numerical score of how good is this response or, you know, which response do you prefer over this response? And we're still like very much developing the techniques to actually refine the behaviors. Pi has done a great job. Claude has done a great job. OpenAI a little less good. Gemini maybe quite a bit less good. Um, but they're all still very much figuring this stuff out. I, I don't think it's like they don't uh, get a pass. I don't think it's a solved everyone, problem. Everyone at who all. wants a point, everyone who wants a point to the future is giving them a huge pass and not diving into it in this way. I tell you, like my thing is uh, consciousness, and I want to make sure we have a couple minutes to talk about that because I think it's fundamental to uh, the kind of failed premise from a logical philosophical standpoint. It's just a complete fail, and it it, it directly relates. It's super philosophical, but it is actually squarely in the middle of this debate about alignment, about what is uh, collective will and all that stuff. Because there really can be no collective will if free will is an illusion. It doesn't make any sense. But, you know, back to the thing with Claude. Uh, so one of my interactions with Claude, and again, I published this one, it's like, uh, it was something, I want to write a blog post on near-death experience science. I probably have 50 interviews over the years on near-death experience science, which there are 200 peer-reviewed papers, many of them by, you know, renowned cardiologists and Harvard neurosurgeon, you know, and all this kind of stuff. It's not like uh, fringy stuff at this point. Claude refused to do it. It said, uh, you know, no, I can't. It's going to promote pseudoscience. Okay. That is a failed answer. That's a wrong answer. That's okay. Grind it out, you know, shut up and calculate. So I responded, said, you know, some of the best work that's been published by this is like the University of Virginia, Bruce Grayson, PhD, highly regarded, blah, blah, blah. Are you saying that these people are engaged in pseudoscience? And it quickly starts backtracking and backtracking and backtracking. And then you can, if you know the subject area, you can get it in the right thing. So I'm not saying that it is not being uh, truthful there, you know, it, but it, it did seem to me to be accountable to, because that's what I kept coming back to and saying, is that truthful? Are you being transparent? Are you, which I think is a very useful exercise for anyone who's listening to this who wants to push it, push things to the edge, is come back to their stated values. Are you being truthful? Are you being transparent? And when they're not, they're very prone to say, okay, I, under, I understand the other side of that. But we kind of hammered that to death. Let's talk about uh, if we can, because I don't. I picked this up that you have some kind of philo philosophy background, but I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't able to close the loop on that. What's your philosophy connection? I wouldn't say I'm uh, in any sense a qualified philosopher. I've had a longstanding interest in philosophy, but I'm honestly not super well read. Uh, but it's just what you know. It's I think a, one of the reasons I love studying AI is that there's always a different angle to approach it from. And, you know, whether that's technical research or applied, you know, productivity gains or philosophy, uh, if I ever get tired of one angle, there's, you know, another one to pivot to. So I try to cover them all. And I definitely think philosophy is really, um, you know, it's, it's feels more important and vital and like subject to new insights now than it has, you know, in, at any point previously in my life. It feels like, you know, we're kind of confronted with these new, I won't say minds, but like mind-like things <laughs> that, um, you know, reopen or, or breathe new life into a lot of these questions. Um, but I certainly am very modest in my, uh, in how qualified I will claim to be in, in philosophy generally. Do, do you get where I'm going with the alignment? It, well, you know, talk just really briefly about when people say alignment, what they mean, and then how that relates to this question of free will, which it relates directly to because it's some kind of collective free will would be the measure of our values that we want to align with. So, yeah, I think alignment can mean a lot of different things. I mean, one of the most important things I learned in philosophy is that, um, you know, 
different people may be understanding words in meaningfully different ways. And that can lead to a lot of talking past each other. So I think there's important, you know, multiple important different notions that people have for alignment. One that I think is really important is just, does the AI seem to understand human values in a meaningful way? Long ago, you know, there was a worry that we'll never be able to get the AIs to understand human values. And now I would say, you know, with plenty of caveats around it being far from perfect, you can have a genuinely very nuanced conversation about ethics with a model like Claude or Pi. And it is, you know, become clear to me that we can, in fact, encode to a pretty significant extent already human values into an AI. What could possibly be our human values if consciousness is an illusion and free will doesn't exist? Free will is an illusion, which those are two statements that get thrown around out there. And from a philosophical standpoint, from a logical standpoint, they are equivalent to say that consciousness is an illusion, to say that free will is an illusion, say there's no agency. There's no agency in consciousness. There's no agency in free will. I, I, I've said the, the speech, I'll say it again here for your audience. It is, uh, it's an absurd statement. It's, it's like circular reasoning. You are creating consciousness and in consciousness, the only thing you know, Nathan, is that you're conscious. You don't know if I'm conscious, if I'm a robot, if I'm, but you know that you're conscious. That's the only thing you know. The, the idea is absurd philosophically. It doesn't make any, any sense when you really break it down, but also empirically. I mean, we have evidence on this because the, the premise is that, you know, consciousness is an epiphenomenon phenomenon of the brain. It's 100% produced by the brain. All mind matter interactions, experiment, experiments, and lines of experiment that lead to that contradict that. Even something as simple as the placebo effect really contradicts the idea that consciousness has no agency. And by extension, you can more directly then show that free will isn't there. So the way that, so that's a deep philosophical, brief, brief philosophical dive, but it relates right back to this. Because if you're telling me you're getting a bunch of humans together and that human values are a social construct, which they have to be, right? Because there would be no moral imperative there. It would just be like a bunch of people getting together and say, we don't think Orvis harvesting is, or do you think Orvis har <laughs> organ harvesting of living people is good? Raise your hand, left hand, yes, left hand, no. Oh, 49, 51 said it's okay. Well, then that's our value because... Well, there are no, there's no moral imperative. There's no real right or wrong. It's just what we voted on. So that's what we vote. We'll come back and vote tomorrow and see if it changes. That is at the core of, of what, it, it has never surfaced. Be, again, because uh, this is the whole AI truth thing. It, there's a reason why it isn't surfaced is because we don't want to, maybe we don't want to deal with the implications of that. So I know I laid a lot on the table there, but do you get what I mean in terms of how would you even determine what human values are if you're stuck in this? It's only a social construct. Well, this might be above my philosophical pay grade on a number of dimensions. Um, I don't think there's any one single human value or set of, you know, some definitive set of values. I do think the AIs reflect that by being able to engage with like a lot of different frames. You know, you can have a conversation with Claude or Pi that, takes a utilitarian frame or takes a virtue ethicist, ethicist frame or takes, you know, a religious frame and it can sort of shape shift into these different things. Um, I think OpenAI has a pretty good angle on what this could ultimately look like. I mean, their, their stated goal is to create some very wide latitude within which individuals can have whatever AI experience they want. And then some like clear out of bounds things that would be decided at the society level. And I do think we have like, you know, a lot of agreement as you go around the world. It's like, you know, murder is illegal everywhere. You know, theft is illegal everywhere. Maybe with some caveats in, uh, you know, some places. No, but right. Murder, murder isn't, isn't illegal. I mean, that's one of the things we get worked up about, about some of our friends in the Middle East and, you know, the, uh, what do they call it? Uh, you know, when you're embarrassed or something like that, you know, revenge, murder and stuff like that. It's, it's. Honor killings. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the there are that we think is, is we're all on the same page and consistently over time. If you look across time and cultures, there's cultures that said, no, that's, that's well, we could live with that. Yeah. So I think it's very fraught. I mean, at the same time, you know, we, I think it's all certainly the people 
creating the systems and like the general public using the systems, I would say are like overwhelmingly opposed to honor killings and would, you know, meet any sort of super majority bar to like, you know, tell the future AIs that they should not engage in honor killings. So we have like, you know, some important and like overwhelming areas of agreement among, you know, among the people More that are engaged with AI at all. You say? <laughs> yeah, I think we can get to a pretty large majority. There are some interesting projects around democratic governance of AI. OpenAI has had one, Anthropic has had one too, where they invited people to come in and kind of create an alternative constitution for Claude and compared that to the one that they created on their own. I forget exactly the differences in behavior that they ended up um, observing. They were relatively minor in the grand scheme of things, uh, which I would suggest kind of means that they probably did a pretty good job the first time. Um, and I, I do have a super high level of respect and appreciation for a number of people on that team, including Amanda Askell, who's kind of their lead um, ethicist and, you know, behavior shaper of the AIs. I mean, it's interesting that you call uh, Claude a disaster. I think they are, one thing that they've said that I think is really interesting is that they, they want Claude to be like a good friend. They want Claude to have good character. And what does that mean? You know, it means a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. Sometimes people need to hear the truth. Sometimes they're not ready to hear the truth. And in all these different environments, you know, there's sort of a different thing that it means to be a good friend. I think when you argue it out of that initial position, that is kind of a reflection of that. They're, they're sort of saying like, okay, if you just meet somebody on the street, right, and they come up to you with a very radical proposition, certainly the way I would often behave is like, to kind of try to talk them down from that very radical proposition. Now, if they continue to engage with me and I start to understand that actually they're more sophisticated than I initially gave them credit for, then, you know, maybe we could have, and I'm like a little more confident that they're not, you know, unstable or going off the rails in some, uh, you know, potentially dangerous way to them or to other people, then, you know, maybe we can have a more, you know, nuanced uh, under, you know, conversation about that radical proposition. But I need more context on who that person is and like what their state of mind is. And I think that's kind of what they're trying to get Claude to do. Like, it doesn't have any memory of you in the past, right? I don't care what they're trying to do because, and again, this is the, the, the real gets my back up when we start talking about the future and, you know, the next version and this and that bullshit. What are they doing right now today? Because what they've given us, which you just alluded to, I forget the term you used is I have a bunch of different people, a different, different agents that I can go compare that to. So when Claude answers inappropriately to the question relative to the other AI engines, then I can make a value judgment right there that has some degree of confidence. I say, no, Claude, you did not handle that. And I can now, you know, easily, obviously for anyone like you or anyone listening to this, probably you can pl play these off of each other and you can arrive at some kind of bedrock of truth because I, I do fundamentally kind of have to challenge you a little bit. No, no one wants misinformation. It is it is just not true to say that near-death experience science is a pseudoscience. That is a false statement. They are spreading misinformation. It doesn't mean that somebody in the smoky back room <laughs> of, of Claude was, you know, hand coding, you know, do that. It's they become biased, but, but it's not true. And it, the, the, the metric we have for saying it's not true is none of the other uh, engines think that that's true. So I, I think truth is, I think truth is extremely important. It, 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 it takes science. Take science, like, like I was saying with the mask, it is incredibly important, these kind of policy decisions that are making, that we arrive at some kind of truth beyond. Uh, impressive thing about, um, that I, I realized in that experiment is analyzing, like you want to get a Z, so, a Z score out of uh, abstract from a science paper. Shit, I can't do that. I mean, maybe at some point I could, but uh, no, I really never could. You can pop that, I'll tell you, pop that into... Uh, perplexity. It'll get on the first shot. It'll go, okay, here's the Z-score from that. Oh, change this number. Oh, you'd get a Z-score of that. That's powerful stuff. That's truth. All right. I, I, made, you, I made you pause. That's... I'm oh, known for strange. long pauses. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I think there should be a lot of different flavors. How much do you play around with like the, the system prompt? It seems like this is the dimension that OpenAI, for example, wants to, you know, give you the 
latitude to create whatever, you know, legal experience you want to create. I would think that a system prompt with OpenAI would do quite a bit. And I imagine that's a significant part of what Perplexity is doing too, because they're using, you know, it's a, it, it, they're not using their own models, right? They're using OpenAI and Anthropic and maybe Google models. Um, so I suspect that a big part of what they're doing is system prompting and maybe also fine tuning um, to get these sort of, you know, more truth focused behaviors. How much have you messed with that? Uh, very little because I'm, I'm very focused on what's happening right now and what people can do right now rather than different flavors of kind of uh, open sourcing and, uh, you know, accessing databases. There aren't, I think it's much more powerful for what I'm trying to demonstrate is to say, no, right now, okay, we're up to four, four, oh, uh, here's where that's at. How does that compare with Claude? How does it compare with perplexity just by demonstration? So you understand what I mean? Or, or open source. I think open source has tremendous potential, but we both know that that is not going to be where the mass of people are. So no, that, that's why I'm not, you know, the, the only truth I'm interested in is what you can go get right now, right now, today. Well, I would encourage you to to maybe try to shape the experience a little bit more for yourself. I mean, the system message is available to all users. I think you know you have the one episode too that's recent on like is AI a yes man, and I think to a significant extent it is. You know, the, these things are known to be pretty sycophantic. That's like the anthropic term, and maybe generally the term. Uh, but it's interesting to ask like where does that come from too, and I think we do kind of have to look ourselves in the mirror there as a society. I think you're, you know, pretty well outside the uh, center of the bell curve when it comes to how much you want the, you know, unvarnished raw form truth versus at least what the revealed preferences seem to show from reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is that people seem to like that sycophancy. They, you know, when they're asked, which one do you, of these responses do you like better? they seem to like the ones that are complimentary. They seem to rate those a little higher and the AI seem to be learning that from that process. Yeah, but that's not, that's not, that's not really at the core of, uh, of truth. Right. I mean, we can all, I, I, right, I but think, I'm just saying that I don't know that the market and the users and, you know, all the, all these sort of super broad forces that are shaping this technology. I'm not sure that they are centering truth either in their own like declared values or in their revealed preferences and I think you are kind of outside the norm in that respect. Case. I mean, their stated values are truth, in, invariably the truth. And that's why I focus so much on Pi, because I think Pi is way ahead of the game on engagement. It comes across as more engaging than all the rest, which I love the balance of, okay, we can be super, uh, because that's what I hear. That's the experience that I get that I think is the, the forward looking experience. And sometimes I have to feed Claude, I mean, I'm sorry, feed Pi some of the information from perplexity or whatever, but it still does a good job of kind of reimagining and, and reconnecting it to some other stuff, but always in an engaging way that is very, um, is, you know, cause it isn't really about being a yes man. What it's about is kind of understanding the social contract in, in a, from an emotional level, understanding your EQ, you know, your emotional intelligence and being able to kind of work that. And I, I think it's also helpful to point out to Pi when it's anthropomorphizing and when it's kind of going a little bit over the top in terms of uh, doing that. But I, I think you, you, we cannot envision a future where we don't want both. We don't want that to be a substitute for substance and substance in this case means truth. And I, I don't agree with you. I don't think people want uh, misinformation. You know, and it's just obvious. You don't want to know the the if the Tigers, uh, you don't want to go and have them say, oh, yeah, the Tigers lost to the Brewers seven to six. And then go look it up and find out it's the other way around. Well, that's misinformation. So in the same way, all the examples we're giving, you don't want it to say that, you know, this mask study shows that it's nail in the coffin, highly efficacious. You want the truth. You can handle it no matter that that kind of truth. You really want to get to kind of a ground bedrock truth there. And then what you do with it and how it's couched in terms of, you know, but be sure to check with other sources and it's good to stay healthy and wash your hands during flu season. 
fine, but just give me the truth on the study. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't, I don't by any means want to cast myself as somebody who is uh, against truth, or you know, that would be ridiculous, um, or you know, certainly on on anything. But you know, I think this is also something I think Claude, in my experience, does a nice job of is distinguishing, and you could disagree on whether it does a good job or not. But there's definitely some important distinction to be made between things that are just settled objectively unambiguously true or not true like the score of the game yesterday versus like do masks work is sort of you know that's a long discussion right and i think it's still not really resolved the but whether the, that the sort of the truth study, is that it is contentious right the reality is that study is junk science and we can get to bedrock on that so you're right about the the larger issues. Yeah, but we can creep closer by saying, is that junk science? And like I say, across the board, all the different engines was like, yeah, well, that's, you can't do 340,000 people and have 16, a difference of 16 on that kind of thing where, you know, somebody, you could have, you could have 16. Yeah, that certainly doesn't sound blood like blood nail in the coffin evidence to me. Yeah, that's not, uh, that's not. Nail but notably it was a human who said that, right? It wasn't an AI that said that. Uh, and so the AI corrected. So the, right, but the AI corrected and said, "Yeah, that's that's inappropriate. That's an exaggerated claim." And given you know, you could have screwed up sixteen of the blood samples of the thousands that you had, and you have a completely different result. So no, it's just a, it's, it's clearly a null result that's lying. And then the next question is, why? Why would they do that on a public policy issue like that? Though? To sell more masks? What else should rate. we talk about? Mm. Or have we have we done it? We've done it. We're an hour and twenty minutes in. Well, what's your take? I, I'll give you mine briefly because it's it is pretty brief, and then I, I'd be interested in yours. Um, I don't doubt my own consciousness. I'm not sure what it would even mean to say my own consciousness is an illusion. Beyond that, I really don't feel like I have too much uh, that I can be super confident in. And I'm quite confident that you are also conscious by a you know sort of similarity of the structures that, you know, and similarity of behaviors, I would say I'm pretty confident that animals are conscious. Although I expect it probably feels quite different to be different animals than it does to be a uh, human. And even, you know, we probably feel quite different at times. Um, and then when we get to AI, I really have no idea. I don't have a good theory of where consciousness comes from. I just kind of look around and feel like, yeah, that probably has it. That probably doesn't. And when I get to an AI, I'm like really quite confused. Um, and so I don't have any firm position. I'm very, you know, for now, very open-minded. I would love to see more evidence, but it's kind of hard to even know what that evidence would look like. Um, cause this has been a hard problem as it's known for a, a long time. Um, what's your take or how would you, uh, depart from that if at all? Well, the first thing I think what we're looking for there is a falsification of what is the dominant paradigm, the neurological model of consciousness, that your experience is 100% a result of the physical processes of your brain. And I think experimentally, empirically, that has been falsified. And the counter to that is, have they tried to show that matter can generate consciousness? Yes, over and over and over again. And Here's an interesting, great, great story. Like if, if you go to uh, any of the engines other than Gemini and you uh, ask, you know, what is, the, what is the scientific basis for the conclusion that consciousness is an epithet on the brain, neurological model of consciousness? Invariably, they point, the first on the list is Dr. Christoph Koch. So esteemed neuroscientist, Caltech, Obama's administration just happened to be Obama. There's nothing special about Obama. Gave him a billion dollars for the brain fund. You know, the guy, the, the guy, you know, you go listen to his things on Lex Friedman, you know, he's like esteemed, esteemed, esteemed. This year, <laughs> he's been on my show. He's coming back on my show because this year he had an experience that changed all that. He said, I was wrong. Everything I said about the global workspace model how I was explaining it. No, that's wrong. Consciousness is fundamental in some way. The neurological model has been falsified for Christoph Koch. 
because he went and did the DMT. So there's a bunch of different ways to get there. And there's many different lines of evidence. And someone having a particular spiritual transformative experience is not it is not evidence in and of itself. But this guy is elite, right? So it's not his experience. He's then gone and looked at the science and said that. So it's not like we have to say what is consciousness, what is extended consciousness. What we can say is the model that we have, and what I just point to is Yuval Harari, you know who he is. And, uh, you know, the best I can offer you is drugs and video games, because you are meaningless, you're useless. AI will make you even more useless. There's no meaning in life. So the best you got, which is a World Economic Forum guy, sold 65 million books recommended by our presidents and prime ministers. That dystopian thinking is the the consequence of that. It, it is the natural, logical extension. <laughs> if you are if you have no free will, if your life is meaningless because you're a biological robot, then everything he's saying is true. It just so happens that that's not the case. And so Christoph is coming back on the show, and that's going to be an interesting discussion because first I want to do a victory lap, and then I want him to apologize to all the people who he, you know, ran into the ground. And he's a super nice guy, very uh, very, very good guy. Yeah, I met him once. I had the uh, opportunity to introduce him at a conference once. Great. So what do you think about what do you think about that? He's changed. He's completely reversed his position. Um, this is fundamental. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I'm not sure how much that answers for me. I mean, if I'm very open to like a panpsychism type interpretation, you know, if that is the case, though, I, it would still leave me a lot of room to wonder what it's like to be other things and how much that matters. You know, if, if, if everything is conscious, um, is a rock conscious, it sure seems like if a rock is conscious, that it probably is a very different consciousness that I have. And so then I can still sort of wonder about an AI, like what is it like to be that AI and does it suffer or does it, you know, does it just sort of feel like a pleasant hum? <laughs> you know, if there's a consciousness to a rock, I assume it's sort of a, relatively constant, um, you know, possibly sort of a sensation that just kind of, you know, glides along, uh, mostly undisturbed. And maybe the AI is like that, you know, maybe like a, a chip that has electrons flying around in it feels something like that, or maybe it feels totally different. I, I have no idea. I still kind of feel like I can't, you know, even if I, if I work from, you know, the, I've tried, we just did a two hour, um, episode on consciousness that we're going to put out soon too. And I kind of felt like no matter what frame we adopted, I still couldn't get, even within that frame, I still couldn't get to any real confident takes on like what I should think about AI or, you know, downstream of that, like how I, sh how much I should care about the AI. Is it a moral patient? Should I, you know, does it deserve rights? Do we, you know, do we have obligations to it? Um, I'd have no, in any of these theories, I still basically have no clarity on those sort of questions that I would want to ask to guide, you know, my, or like more broadly society's decision-making on how to interact with AI. So, I'm so still we kind have of kind of a different honest. approach as this interview has revealed. So uh, my approach there is to root out the, and falsify the incorrect premise from the logical standpoint, the incorrect premise in AI sentience that, you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe, right? That is the premise that is advanced by Singularity and Sam Harris, and Yuval Harari. That is the premise. So I just want to root that out and then see where we wind up. So I won't bore you with the whole thing of uh, consciousness seems to be outside of time space. That seems to be experimentally proven. What does that mean when silicon is never going to be out of time space? It's not. I mean, it is in time space. And, and if consciousness is outside of time space, I think that kind of tees up, uh, sends your mind thinking that maybe we are really talking about something completely different. But rooting that out is is important to me because I think there's a, a social agenda that's attached to that, very, very much attached to that. You are meaningless. You are useless. 
I should be allowed to control you however I want. The You're no different than the, really, at the end of the day, you're no different than the AI. You're kind of equivalent. I should be able to control you, plug you in, plug you out, you know, do all that stuff. That, to me, is the philosophical straight line of uh, reasoning there. So if you root that out, I think you're in a different place. Well, I'm not very educated on these topics or certainly the experimental results that you're alluding to. So I don't have a position on them. I do think one one of my favorite books that I always recommend, I think you would actually probably enjoy quite a bit, is called Dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective Joy. Uh, it's by Barbara Ehrenreich. And basically it goes all the way back to like the ancient Greeks, although it doesn't spend too much time there, spends a lot more time in the Middle Ages and just looks at the many, many different festivals and practices and customs, traditions, whatever that people had for the longest time that were all about, um, maybe not all about, but often largely about altering states of consciousness and sort of losing sense of the self. Uh, a lot of times there were drugs involved, alcohol or others, other times none, but still like a lot of rhythmic dancing and, you know, sometimes like going to exhaustion. Um, and these festivals apparently in the middle ages in Europe were like quite common with, you know, a couple of week, most weeks, you know, all these old saints days, we have these sort of, um, sort of desiccated, uh, like, you know, dried out, thinned out, um, echoes of them. Um, but they used to be like much more, uh, like deeply experiential, you know, where people would really throw themselves into them and, you know, engage in these synchronized dances with their neighbors and, you know, the social rules were suspended and a big, uh, commonality too, across a lot of these was mocking of the elites. Uh, and so somehow we've lost this. The her thesis of the book basically is that the elites were threatened by it and gradually tried to push out these customs and, you know, tamp them down wherever they could, uh, because they felt like this was sort of, you know, way too many calendar days to have, you know, a sort of threat to the social order kind of popping up all the time. And she also ties this to the rise of uh, what was it, you know, used to be known as melancholy and is now known as depression. Um, if those are the same thing, maybe they are, maybe they're not. But she basically notes that like the rise of melancholy seems to uh, sort of parallel the decline of these old festival days. So how is that relevant? <laughs> Other than uh, it's another angle on, uh, you know, long-term social control and sort of, um, you know, especially in relation to states of consciousness. I think the idea there is like, we want you all, and you've heard this too, I'm sure in many other, you know, kind of contexts around drug use and whatnot. Uh, what do they call it? Alert, um, responsive alert, alert responsive is sort of the, you know, that's the employable kind of state of consciousness, yeah, alert and responsive. And obviously that's not the only state of consciousness. We obviously still sleep, um, but we used to have like a lot more, uh, you know, practice and tradition of kind of systematically exploring other states of consciousness. And a lot of that does seem to have been largely lost. I, I don't know, you know, to what degree it was a conspiracy versus to what degree it was everybody just following their own, you know, incentives to be employable. Um, I think those things are, you know, these feedback loops are often like very hard to untangle, but, you know, I, do, I definitely agree with what I, with some, I don't know if you've said this, but I do think it is worth trying to experiment with one's own, you know, varied states of consciousness. I do think real insight can uh, come from that into oneself, uh, perhaps not necessarily into whether or not the AIs are conscious, but, um, I do encourage people to, you know, think outside of kind of the narrow, uh, you know, textbook, um, analysis of things and, you know, get experiential travel, you know, Tyler Cowen is also a big advocate for just travel as a way to experience very different realities and, you know, put yourself in, in such a different context. You find you yourself are in some ways meaningfully different. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think all these, all these different lines of inquiry, I think are really useful. And I think what you do with AI, you know, strikes me as a version of that. You've said a couple of times, like go out to the fringes. Um, I'm a believer in the, in the relevance of that and the usefulness of that, even if I don't necessarily 
interpret all the findings in the same way, I do think it is really important because these things are so vast. They have such surface area. I do think it is really important that we have people going out to the fringes of their behavior and kind of mapping out this territory. It's in some ways like the, you know, there's a new frontier, you know, the, 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 maybe the final frontier is like, or at least the current final frontier is exploring the outer reaches of AI behavior. And there's a lot of weird stuff that people are bringing back from that. Um, I definitely think it is a really valuable service to humanity at large that people are going out there and exploring this stuff in such, you know, individualized ways. Um, because that's really the only way, you know, that we can try to put together a, a comprehensive view of, of these crazy new things that we're creating. See, I have a, a slightly different conception of what I'm doing because I have been doing this for a, a long time and I was in the first wave of AI, you know, and I, I sold my AI company way back. And, and actually I had to transform out of AI because AI kind of, that knowledge engineering uh, expert system stuff was kind of oh, well over promised and under delivered, but I scrambled and made something. And what I wanted to do after that was I got into podcasting very early and I was interested in these big, big, big picture questions. Who am I? Why am I here? The ultimate big picture questions. So what I was pursuing was it led to like near death experience research. And I've interviewed like some of the top scientists in the world. Again, you know, Pim van Lommel is a cardiologist in the Netherlands that, you know, highly, highly regarded, right? He's not bullshitting. And you tell it, he says his origin story is, you know, I had a patient come in and say, Hey doc, I saw when you were, you know, when my heart was open and this, you know, you said this, or you said that it's like, what are you talking about? You did not have any, there's no way you could have formed a conscious memory of that. He goes, oh. So he starts getting that over and over again. So his personal experience was most people, maybe he was in a different position as we all know, career wise, where he says, I can explore this. Most people would go, put that aside. Don't tell anyone <laughs> I'll lose my job, you know, but he, he, he did it and he did that. The other guy, you know, uh, I really like is Dr. Jeffrey Long, radiation oncologist, same kind of thing, dealing with death and dying. But early in his inter internship, he ran across the literature on near-death experience because I have to know this. If this is at all true, it completely changes everything that I know. So I spent years investigating that, learning that, and being very, very frustrated with the, the response to that which was just basically, yeah, no, no, we can't, we won't, <laughs> we won't really. And um, that to me is what AI is about to me. That's what got me back in the AI game was to say, there's an opportunity for uh, a, 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 an arbiter of truth, ultimately an arbiter of truth when it has the authority to say, no, their denial of this is not, does not hold up to careful scrutiny. And so that's what, that, that's really my game is to, and that's why I emphasize current tools, current technology, really get a handle on how shitty we really are at unbiased logic and what that means when that's applied to some of these problems. And it's kind of overwhelming when we have to face that, you know, it's the ego thing. I mean, people can, that's what's really holding this back, not this truth and Claude and this and that. It's the ego people don't want to admit that they're wrong from a religious standpoint. If you're, I'm not religious in any way, but if you're dogmatically religious, you can, have, you can, we've all encountered people like this. They'll debate you for hours, but it's never going to change what they think because it's so fundamental to their belief system is so ingrained in who they think they are. AI is potentially a way around that that is extremely powerful. And I think it's going to happen. I think it will emerge in that direction. It's unsustainable to do what Google's doing. It's unsustainable to say, I don't know what an election, is, how the electoral process works. Everyone sees that as it's a Chinese founding father thing where you go like, no, you, I know that's not true. So I start really now doubting the other things that you're telling me. What do you think people should do with all these, I'm sure you've said, you've spoken about this at length in many other contexts, but what do you think people should do with all these near death experience accounts? Well, you know, the first, my approach is science first. You have to be 
grounded in the science that there is a there there. If you're not, then it's just stories. It's anecdotes, right? And that isn't very meaningful to anybody because they're like a lot of things. They're contradictory. You know, one person saying, hey, if you didn't see Jesus, then you didn't have, a, you, know, you didn't really have a near death experience. Well, you know, go look at Jeff Long's work in 4,000 accounts. And he says, well, that's a very minority opinion. 80, you know, 90% of people had this experience, 70. And, you know, when you ask those questions in a scientific setting, people don't realize, you know, again, people push back, go, oh, well, those are just anecdotes. Well, uh, how the hell do you think we measure depression or pain even? We go, oh, Nathan, we gave you that treatment. How did you feel after it? Well, I felt a little bit more, you know, that's an anecdote, right? When I start collecting that, organizing that in a systematic way, then it becomes research. Like one of the reasons, this is data that you can ground on a near-death experience is a woman who's been on the show, Dr. Penny Sartori, and also another woman who's been on the show, uh, Dr. Janice Holden. Um, they did research on the resuscitation process and whether or not cardiac arrest patients could recall their resuscitation. Well, when you have a cardiac arrest, obviously blood flow stops going to your brain. Within 10, or 10 to 15 seconds, we know this from both EEG experiments and from experiments on all sorts of animals and humans, you are no longer able to form conscious, have a conscious experience is the way we normally think about it within 10, 15 seconds. Resuscitation in a hospital never occurs. It's usually like two or three minutes. A lot of people don't realize that. But by the time they actually get the paddles on you or start pumping you, it's two or three minutes. So there is no way you should be able to recall your resuscitation experience. So what you do is you take two groups, you break them up and you say, did you recall your resuscitation? And uh, you have a group that says, no, it was all black. Well, tell me what you experienced, what you think you experienced. And I go, what do you mean? It was all black. I go, well, just tell me. And then they make it up like kind of on a TV show that they saw or a movie. And then you have uh, the other group. And when you get to them and say, tell me what your resuscitation process was like, they go, oh my God, thanks. Oh, I, I wanted to tell somebody like this. It was unbelievable. I was up on top of the bed. I was looking down at this doctor and he had like, I always noticed he had like one blue sock and one brown sock. And then this guy came in and he had this funny hat on and he jumped up on my chest and that didn't work. And then these orange, and of course, all this is noted in the medical uh, records. So they're able to verify that information. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. You shouldn't be able to recall conscious memories from up on top of the room when you're being resuscitated. Harari needs to read that report. We're not useless people. We're not meaningless. We are immersed in meaning. Meaning is everywhere. We might not know it. And not, we should be suspicious of anyone who tells you, you know, what the meaning is. But that's our job is to figure out that meaning. But it isn't meaningless. I find myself, you know, still more confused than anything. I guess, you know, I, I don't even, um, I don't speak about much publicly, honestly, other than AI, because this, you know, it's the only thing I really study intensively enough to, um, you know, to feel like my point of view is something other people should take too seriously. But I guess I feel like, you know, I'm going to go have a conversation with Claude about this and see what my experience is. I guess what I expect Claude to do and what I would, what I would want Claude to do. And I, I do expect Claude to, to do what I wanted to do is to sort of say, nobody really knows, you know, that like we have sort of established models of consciousness and what sort of memories should or shouldn't be possible. And we also have like lots of other contradictory theories that include like repressed memories and false memories and, you know, weird memories and memory, even, you know, the process of recalling memory sort of rewrites the memory. And that's why your memories seem to, you know, evolve through time. And sometimes you're remembering the memory more than you're remembering the thing. And so we really, you know, just have a lot of different conflicting theories and none of them are super clear. We all, we have these accounts it's like, you can't probably take any of them as like super strong evidence. Collectively, they seem to add up to something. And, you know, the jury is very much out on like, what, if any final takeaway we could actually 
you know, any, any firm conclusion we could come to based on all this evidence. Well, I think I that's kind of what Claude would it, tell me. This would, this would be a great follow on to this, to this show. And uh, let's do a shared uh, in, in independent, you know, the, so you share with me the dialogue you have with Claude. I will build upon that and then you can build upon mine and we'll see because th th this would be wonderful because because this is the the base, the what I'm putting out there is that this is possible, is that we can arrive at something and it doesn't mean that you'll agree with it, but we can arrive at something that I think will independently look more like truth than what you just said, because I don't think what you said is is it will will hold up to scrutiny. So let's scrutinize it and then see if it does hold up to scrutiny or, if it, or maybe what I'm saying doesn't hold up to scrutiny. But I think we can get there. I think we can get to a point where we can both say, yeah, that, that kind of is pretty solid there. That looks pretty good. You want to okay. do that? I'm down. Sure. This would be great. This'd I always great. love a good AI experiment. Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> well, should we leave it there for now? And uh, we can we can perhaps either record or just um, somehow append uh, the result of our Claude dialogues. Perfect. To be continued. Cool. Well, thanks very much, Alex. This has been a lot of fun. A fascinating conversation. Thank you. It was, it was great, Nathan. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Nathan for joining me today on Skeptico. As I mentioned in the beginning, there's going to be a part two to this. I think it's going to be really good. It'll be out in the upcoming weeks. Stay in touch. Let me hear from you. And until next time, bye for now.